Our subject tonight is perhaps a strange-sounding one. It's called God in Bad Company. And I want to read to you just a part of Psalms 20 and verse 1. And this is what it says, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. I read the whole verse. But that last part, the name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Now, Christian friends, we have some, some proverbs that we all know. And they are known around the world. One of them is that a man is known by the company he what? He keeps, yes. We all know that. Here's another. Birds of a feather do what? Flock together. In other words, we generally associate with like kind. A filthy-minded man does not enjoy the company of a pure-minded man. Birds of a feather flock together. In the scriptures, there are warnings against keeping bad company. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 14 is one of those. Romans 16 and verse 17 is another. But you know, not long ago, I read an article on name dropping. Name dropping. As a matter of fact, the article which I read said that this is the favorite sport in Hollywood, California. So many hopefuls gather out there hoping to strike it rich in show business. And compared to those who come, those who really become famous are relatively few. And so if you go into that area, you'll find people walking the streets and working as uh, maids and as uh, waitresses and chauffeurs and all other kinds of jobs. People who hope someday to get a big break in show business. And the article suggested that many of these people love to go to parties and hope to shake hands with a star or a producer. And if they can do it, then they will talk about it and drop those names as though they're good friends. Name dropping. In many cases, these are people who have not yet attained very much. And they are trying to ride to the top on the name of an ascending star. The article called them social parasites. Name droppers. Well, I've seen some of that done, haven't you? You've got ordinary people in ordinary towns who want you to think that they're very close friends with the big shots. And so they love to drop their names and as if they are buddies, you know, and even first name, name dropping. It seems all kind of uh, incredible to me that a man could be so insecure that calling somebody else's name would help him to feel better. He lacks self-image generally. But it is a fact, ladies and gentlemen, that through name dropping, people have been given admittance into places where otherwise they could not go. Through name dropping, they've been allowed credit that otherwise they could not have. They have been granted confidences simply because they drop names. I have a brother who's a fine Christian young man now, but when he was young, he was not a Christian. And, and, and one day he was driving and, and he broke the law with his car in the South in those days. And the policeman stopped him and frankly, he was afraid. And they had a way of talking to you that'll make you afraid in those days. And so my brother, being a youngster and driving and having broken the law, was quite nervous when this great big policeman was yelling at him and talking in such a rough way. And finally he said to him, give me your license. Now, Greensboro at that time had about 130,000 people in it. But when that policeman took my brother's license and saw the name on there, he, he, he looked at it. And then he looked at my brother and said, are you Bob Brooks's son? My brother said immediately he started feeling better. He didn't know how on earth this man happened to know our dad. But the minute he saw that name, he said, are you Brooks's son? And my brother said, yes, sir. You know, quickly, yes, sir, I am. He said, all right, I'm going to let you go. But if I ever catch you again, I'm going to tell your daddy on you. Oh, I'm glad that a name means something. My parents raised 11 children. 
I only have seven sisters. And by the grace of God, we've never spent a night in jail. And, and my daddy told me, son, I don't have riches to give you. But you got a good name. Try to take care of it. And I've thought about it many a time when the devil suggested foolishness to me. I got a name that stands for something. And while I'm on the subject, if you are called a Christian, that's a name that ought to stand for something. Would you say amen out there? You ought not call yourself that unless you're going to live like one. Unless you're going to be careful where you go and what you say and what you do and who you fool around with. Name dropping. Now I ask you, could the great God of heaven be name dropping? Why would he say, the God of Jacob defend thee? Well, is it possible that any name could add luster to the name of God? Why that name? If God's going to name drop, why Jacob? For the name Jacob has a bad connotation. Jacob means thief, con man, one who takes by fraud. It seems to me that if God was going to drop names, he might have said, I am the God of Jesus Christ. Referring to his only begotten son, the prince of heaven, pure and undefiled, perfect personification of righteousness and holiness and love and kindness. But he didn't. Or God might have said, I am the God of the angel Gabriel, that bright angel that stood in the place of the fallen Lucifer, who is known for his devotion to God and his loyalty and his faithfulness. But he didn't. Or God could have said, I am the God of Melchizedek, flawless priest of Salem, man with impeccable reputation, but he didn't. God could have said, I am the God of Jacob. And that's what he did say. A bad connotation. Why that name? Why not the son of Jacob, whose name was Joseph? A young man of such integrity that he preferred to go to jail rather than make love to a beautiful woman who happened to be another man's wife. Why didn't he say, I am the God of Joseph? Or why didn't he say, I am the God of the Virgin Mary? A virgin so pure and so clean and so humble and so submissive to the dictates and holy impulses of God that she was chosen to bear in her body the embryo divine. Why did he say, I am the God of Jacob? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what he called himself. And he did so over and over. And by the way, when this was recorded, Jacob had been dead for centuries. And still God rubs up that name and associates his holy name with it. If, if he's going to name drop, why didn't he choose a better name than that? What kind of company is that for the God of heaven to associate his name with? Well, you ought to take a look at Jacob. He was a thief and a con man. He conned his old daddy out of the birthright blessing. And he cheated his brother Esau out of what was rightfully his. For Esau was the firstborn. And as the firstborn, he had a right to the birthright in that family. Which meant he should become priest of the home, he should get most of his father's goods, and he should be progenitor of the promised Messiah. That's what the birthright involved. No wonder it was so precious. And Jacob came up with a scheme involving his mother that he fooled and deceived his aged father, stole that birthright. And when Esau found out about it, he was going to kill him as sure as he laid eyes on him. And Jacob had to flee from home for his life. And he ran so hard and so long that finally in exhaustion he fell down on the ground. And having nothing but a stone for a pillar, he went to sleep. And while he was sleeping, there appeared to him a vision. And he saw a ladder extended from earth to heaven. And angels ascending and descending on that ladder. And as he was having this vision, Jesus spoke to Jacob and said, I'm going to make of you 
a great nation. And through your seed, the promise to Abraham and Isaac shall be fulfilled. Christ ratified the birthright with Jacob. And Jacob got up and thanked God, but he's scared to go home. So he went on down to Mesopotamia, and he saw a beautiful girl. And he decided he wanted to marry her, so he went to talk to her father, who was a crook, Laban. And he said, work for me seven years, you can have it. And after he had worked seven years for that one lady, that father tricked him and sent in another daughter instead of the one he wanted, who was, hate, who was Rachel. And when Jacob found out he'd been deceived, he worked another seven years for Rachel. He spent more than 20 years in Mesopotamia, and God prospered him so. And finally, he decided it's time to go home and inherit the promise. And when he got all his servants lined up, and all of his family lined up, and when he got all of his sheep and all of his cattle lined up, this man was fabulously rich. And now he's going home after more than 20 years to receive the promise of God. Well, in the first place, Laban gave him trouble. And when he finally settled that, he pressed on toward home. And he sent some of his men out ahead to see what the land was like. And all of a sudden, the scouts came riding back to him. And they said, Jacob, we got bad news. We've got some bad news. Your brother Esau is coming to get you. He's got hundreds of armed men. He's coming like a man going to war. You don't stand a chance with Esau. And ladies and gentlemen, that brought trouble to Jacob such as he had not experienced since he left home. Now the trouble was not that Esau had him by the throat. The trouble was that God had made him a promise and now that he's going home to get it, it seems like God maybe made a mistake. And so it is his faith now that is being tested. Would you say amen out there? And Jacob was in such straits over this that he sent his family on a little further and he separated even from his wife. He walked across the Jabbok brook and there he fell down in the evening time and began to pour out his heart to God. Ladies and gentlemen, there are times when your friends can't help you. There are times when your wife can't help you straighten out your problem. There are times when only you and God can get it together. Jacob got away from everybody else and he began to pray and darkness fell. And as darkness fell, someone laid hold of Jacob and he began to wrestle and he began to struggle. We are told that that was a country full of bandits and robbers. And Jacob thought maybe one of these crooks had caught hold of him and Jacob was tussling and scrapping for his life. And it went on hour after hour and he was matching strength with whoever this was that had a hold of him. He was wrestling and praying and crying at the same time when all of a sudden we are told that this visitor touched him on the thigh and crippled him. And a Christian writer under inspiration says that when he was crippled, then he understood it was the Lord. I want to pause with that for a minute. You know, atmosphere of prosperity is not usually the best atmosphere in which to develop spiritual graces. When we are getting along all right, we don't pray as we ought. We become proud and big-headed, you know, and very independent about God. We can take him or leave him. And if he says something we don't like, we'll ignore him. In order to save us, sometimes the Lord has to cripple us. We don't even know God until the weight gets heavy on our shoulders. We don't bow down until the burden is so heavy we can't bear it. We don't look up until we're flat of our backs. God is not a sadist. Human nature demands discipline. And sometimes God has to cripple us. He has to wreck our cars. He has to put us in the hospital. He has to burn down these houses in order to get our attention. Jacob didn't even know who it was until the Lord crippled him. And when he was crippled and dragging one leg, it was then that Jacob started crying out, Lord, I didn't know it was you. Lord, I'm going to hold on to you. Lord, I need you now. My faith is in the balance and I'm about to lose my way. And they wrestled on until sun was coming up. And the Lord said to Jacob, the sun is coming up. Let me go. Jacob said, I will not let you go. One writer said Jacob was not boasting of physical strength. For if he had been saying, I'm strong enough to hold you and I'm not going to let you go, he would have been destroyed right there. That isn't what he meant at all. Jacob meant something infinitely more important than that. 
Jacob had believed God for more than 20 years. All of a sudden, the devil had suggested doubt. Esau is coming. The word of God will not be fulfilled. God will not keep his promise. You are not going to become a great nation. Through your seed, the Messiah will not come. Jacob had believed the promise of God all these years. All of a sudden, the devil begins to test his faith and to suggest it can happen and to suggest doubt. And Jacob began to doubt. That's why he was over there praying in the first place. But when he knew that God had a hold of him, and the Lord said, let me go. Jacob was not saying, I'm going to hold you with physical strength. Jacob was saying, I've made up my mind. My faith lays hold on God. My faith is anchored in the Lord. I have decided to believe the word of God, even though I can't see how it can come to pass. I'm going to believe it anyhow. I'm not going to let it go. You might as well give me that blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. I'm going to hold on anyhow. It was then that the Lord said, what is thy name? The Lord knew his name. But he wanted Jacob to admit what he was. What is thy name? My name is Jacob, Lord. Almost ashamed to say so because all around the world at that time, they had heard about this fellow who cheated his brother. And wherever the name of Jacob was, people laughed and people thought of him as being a crook. What is your name? My name is Jacob. I'm going to change your name. Henceforth, thou shalt be called Israel. For thou hast wrestled with God and prevailed. Let everybody say amen out there. And by the way, I want to tell you, he can still change your name. Some of you have bad reputations. Some of you are known as drunks. He can change your name. Some of you are known as dope addicts up and down the streets of Washington, D.C. He can change your name. Some of you women folk are known as flirts and forward and fresh. He can change your name. And lift reproach from your soul, ladies and gentlemen. That's the glory of God as it comes to rest upon a converted sinner. He is able to change your way so much that you get a new reputation around town. And instead of talking about what you used to be, you will be showing them so much now. They will only see what you are at the present and your name will be changed. I asked Jesus to change my name. And he changed my name. Bless the Lord. He's able to do it. Henceforth, thou shalt be called Israel. And yet, even though he changed his name, and even though over and over and over again God called himself the God of Israel, now and again, now and again throughout the history of those people, just to encourage the lost and just to say something to no good folks, he calls himself the God of Jacob. What he's doing is name dropping. And he's using a name that stands for nothing in order to say to you and me, I keep bad company. Thank God tonight he keeps bad company. What do you say out there? The Bible tells me something and I want to read it to you. One day I was preaching at a college. A young blonde girl knocked on the door of my office and she came in and I'll never forget how she looked. Her eyes were purple, tears rolling down her face. She said, Pastor Brooks, I listen to those things you say and I want to be a Christian. But she said, I've gone too far. Heaven can't save me. I just don't believe there's grace enough to save me. I said, young lady, how old are you? She said, I'm 19. I said, what makes you think you've done so much in just 19 years that Jesus can't save you? I said, what makes you think that you're a greater sinner than he is a savior? I said, I want to read you something. And I said, I want you to stand behind my chair and look in my Bible. And I turned to Hebrews chapter 11. Now we call that God's honor roll. Hebrews chapter 11 contains the name of people who are going to be saved by faith. And it starts off with Abel, the first man to die. And the Bible says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Then it says, by faith, Enoch. And you come on down a little further. By faith, Noah. You come on down a little further. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. And you come all the way down the list to Moses. And then all of a sudden, you come to verse 31. And I want you to listen to this. It says, by faith, the harlot Rahab. 
Everybody ought to say amen out there. Y'all know what a holiday is, don't you? That's a prostitute. And here in God's honor roll is the name of a prostitute who overcame by faith. Well, now, who was this woman, Rahab? She was a prostitute in Jericho. And one day, it is possible, she went down to meet the caravan coming in off the desert. She often met these men. She had on her special garments that identified her trade in flesh. She had a golden chain about her forehead, her face and lips highly painted. She had all the signs, and I can imagine she had her little black book, you know. And she went down by the well where the caravan stopped to water their beasts, as she'd always done. Except there's excitement by the well this time. The people are talking about a god who had set about three million slaves free. They were talking about a God who saw these slaves come into a mountain pass and behind them was Pharaoh's army and in front of them was the Red Sea and that God was so powerful that he dried up the water in the middle of the Red Sea and let the children of Israel pass over. Rahab heard about a God who rained water out of a dry rock heard about a God who brought down bread from heaven when his people got hungry and as she began to listen and to hear about this God faith sprang alive in her heart she rushed home and washed her face she took off those clothes she'd been wearing she tore up a little black book she began to ask questions around do any does anybody know anything about that God and folks thought she'd lost her mind what's the matter with you Rahab you've been making a lot of money why are you getting so excited? You didn't see God open the Red Sea. You didn't see God bring water out of a dry rock. You didn't see God rain down bread from heaven. Rahab responded, it's true, I didn't see it. I just heard and I believe. I believe. And when the spies came over into Jericho, Rahab helped to hide some of those men. And when they got ready to go, she said to them, listen, I believe in your God. I believe that he's going to give you this land. And when you come back, he's going to give you victory. I'm asking you then because I believe. I'm asking you to spare my life when you come back. And the, 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 the men of God said, we're going to spare your life. You take a red rope and hang it in the window of your house. And when we come back, we're going to look for a house with a red rope in the window. And wherever we see that red rope, whoever's in that house is going to live. Now, if Rahab had been like a lot of us, she would have gone out and started grabbing her friends and bringing them in the house. Uh-uh. That's not what Rahab did. First thing Rahab did was get that red rope and put it in the window. She wanted to make sure she was saved before she went out meddling with other folks. Before you got a right to preach and teach and testify and pray, you ought to make sure that you are living right. Before you start worrying your children half to death, you ought to make sure that you are living right in front of them. And red is the symbol of salvation. Red typifies the blood of Jesus. I told you last night, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. God will take the red blood of Jesus Christ and wash away your scarlet sins and make you as pure as though you never sinned in your life. Rahab got that red rope and put it in the window. And then she ran out to make sure it could be clearly seen. When you're living right, you ought to make sure that your witness is clear. And after she made sure, then she went and got her mama and her daddy and her cousins and her friends and her neighbors. And she said, whoever comes into my house will live. Years later, when Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down in veritable Niagara's of cascading stones, they walked over the walls and began to hew down indiscriminately the old and the young. Suddenly, somebody remembered that prostitute. And the word went out from Joshua, look for a house with a red rope in the window, and whoever's in that house shall live. And they searched up and down the streets, everywhere they went, looking for one thing, not looking for a lot of talk, not looking for a lot of pleading, not looking for a whole lot of money and a whole lot of property, looking for a red rope. That was the symbol of salvation. And when they found that simple sign, they knocked on the door. Is Rahab here? I am here. Then you and your household shall live. That same man out there. And the Bible says she's going to be in heaven by faith. A prostitute. 
Y'all think that's something, don't you? Well, let me tell you what's really something. When you go to Matthew chapter 1 and you read the earthly genealogy of Christ, it goes on with all these begets, simply meaning he gave birth to. Now listen to some of it. And Judas begat Phares and Zara of Thema. And Phares begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naason, and Naason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab. Wait a minute. When the Lord lays hold on you, he changes your ways. When the Lord lays his hands on you, he changes your lifestyle. Let's say amen out there. This woman who had been available to many men got her act together by the grace of God and she straightened up and became so desirable and so dignified and so good that a good man decided he wanted her to marry him. And they had a little baby whose name was Boaz, that's Boaz of the Old Testament, who saw Ruth gleaning in the field and he married Ruth and it says that Boaz begat Obed of Ruth and Obed begat Jesse and Jesse had several sons. One of them was named David and Jesus Christ is the root and offspring of David. Let everybody say amen out there. Look out here. God keeps bad company. In the family tree of Jesus Christ is a whore who overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Would you say amen out there? Oh, I like that. That gives me hope tonight. You know, there are times you make such a rotten mess of your life, your own mom and daddy don't want to be bothered with you. One day a man had a daughter, 16 years old, got pregnant. Now that's wrong. But after the fact, you got to be a parent. And the man was so hurt and embarrassed, that selfishness, thinking about himself and his name, that he told that 16-year-old girl, get out, don't want to ever see you again. Somebody called me and told me about it. I took off over there. I said, man, what is wrong with you? Oh, he said, she made her bed hard. Let her lie down in it. I said, my friend, how many times have you acted the fool? How many times have you sinned against God? The wages of sin is death. You made your bed hard. Suppose heaven had sent that decree down to you. You made your bed hard, lie in it. You would be hopelessly lost. Tears started running down his face. He reached out and took his daughter's hand and let that girl stay home. Amen. At times you make such a mess, even your family is ashamed of you. Folks in your neighborhood won't even look at you. When they come by, they turn their heads the other way. They won't even shake hands with you. Well, I want to tell you tonight, when your life is such a mess that you can't even keep your head up in good company, when nobody wants to bother with you, there is a God in heaven. And he will reach down and say, when nobody else wants you, I'll take you. I'll take you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. When your own family has put you out, come unto me, I'll take you. When you are so rotten and no good that you're good for nothing, I'll take you. And the Bible says further, he's not ashamed to be called your brother. I'm not ashamed of you. Liar, come unto me. Adulterer, come unto me. If you think I'm not sincere, I've got a prostitute in my family tree. Come unto me. I am a great God because I stoop and keep bad company. Let's say amen. That's our hope. That's our only hope tonight. That's our only hope. I want you to look at another case or two. I want you to see a handsome young man who is king in the most prosperous nation on earth. Things are going well for him. Everything, it seems, at his beck and call. One day he goes up on the roof and he looks across on another housetop and he sees a woman naked taking a bath. He desires her. That's lust. He decided to have her. He sends for her. Finds out she's married. Her husband is one of his soldiers. Sends that husband up to the front line. Puts him in a situation where he's bound to die. Then takes his wife, Bathsheba. Oh, you can't sin with impunity. David tore up a man's home in order to get his wife. And what happened to his home? His own daughter 
was raped. His son Ammon became a rapist. His son Absalom became a conspirator and tried to kill his own father and eventually lost his life in the battle. He tore up another man's home and now the hand of retribution rests on his home and the family of David was disordered and torn asunder. One day David saw the error of his ways. He fell down on his knees and he cried, Lord, this is Psalm 51, have mercy upon me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly of all my sins and iniquities. Take them all away. And the Lord heard David's prayer. He not only heard it, but he forgave him. And later on the Lord said, David is a man after mine own heart. But you know, David couldn't outlive that reputation. I read a story in the Bible where one man was so disgusted with David that when David's chariot was going down the road, he ran along the hillside and threw rocks at him. People hated David because of what he'd done. He'd come to a bad reputation. But God said, David, I'll take you. I'll take you. David was a man that had been admired all his life. He was a man who was handsome and he had a great appearance and very successful as a leader. He was accustomed to people admiring him. Now everybody is turning their backs and folks are gossiping. Folks who do the same thing he did are talking about him everywhere. David is looking around for some loyal friend. David is looking around for somebody that will speak an encouraging word. I want to tell you there comes a time when you can't look to other people. Everywhere he looked, they were gossiping. Everywhere he looked, they were putting his name in the dirt. Finally, David decided, I'm going to smart up. I'm going to stop looking around. I don't see anything but discouragement when I look around. Well, what you going to do, David? I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. I'm going to turn my eyes toward the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and I'm going to cry out to him to have mercy. And God said, David, I'll take you. I am a God who keeps bad company. I'll take you. I'm not ashamed of you. I'll save you. I've just been waiting on you to ask me to forgive you and take your sin away and I'll put you back on your throne and you're going to die with honor. And of all the kings in Israel, more Jews today name their sons David than any other name under the sun because God is a God who keeps bad company. Would you say amen out there? And then my Bible tells me about a woman caught in adultery. And if you read the authorized version, it says, caught in the act. Now, that's important. You see, sometimes folk lie on you. Sometimes folks spread rumors that are not true. But they caught this woman, and the law of Moses said she should be stoned to death immediately. By the way, the law of Moses said that the woman and the man should be stoned to death. But by the time of Christ, the men folks who happened to run everything had adjusted the law so that only the woman died. And the man who was caught with her could actually help stone her. So they caught her. And like folks today, they created a great big scene to attract a lot of attention. You see, whenever they caught somebody in their dirt, it made them look a little holier. So they wouldn't dare go quietly. They went there with a lot of fanfare, dragged that woman out of that house, not properly clothed. Drag her out, their dirty fingernails biting into her quivering flesh. Her hair was disheveled and falling over her face. And they're dragging her through the dusty street and keeping up such a racket that men come running to see what it is. And when they see what it is, they look around for some stones. And everyone has an armful of rocks coming along behind. And that woman hasn't even the courage to look up. She is filthy. She knows she is. She knows she deserves to die. And women who've done the same thing throw open their windows and spit. And on the way outside the city, they got an idea. This man, Jesus, has been interfering with our processes. And let's take this woman over to see what he has to say. And if he goes against the law of Moses, we're going to stone him too. And so they made a detour and went to where they heard Jesus was. And I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus knew before they got there what was going on. He saw them coming. He saw how they were manhandling that woman. By now, her clothes were tattered and torn. 
And they didn't care that too much of her flesh was being publicly revealed. They didn't care that they didn't even give her a chance to wipe her nose or her eyes. Only her tears washed clean little streaks down her face. And they brought that woman over to where Jesus was and they slammed her down at his feet. And I want to pause to say that when you've made a mess out of your life, that's the best place on earth to be, at the feet of Jesus. What do you say out there? I'd rather Jesus take care of me than y'all. And you better be glad I'm not in charge because I'd fix some of y'all. Amen. I'm glad Jesus is the judge. Aren't you? threw that woman down in a huddle heap and they were so loud in their accusations and they were carrying on their filth so loud that Christ, being a gentleman, wouldn't even look at that woman. She'd been through enough. Instead of looking at them, he looked at, at the men who brought her. Ladies and gentlemen, there is in the eyes of a righteous man moral restraint and the eyes of a guilty man cannot bear the eyes of a righteous man. That's when you, your child does wrong, he drops his head. He can't look at you. And when you have messed up and folks know it, you can't look people in the eye. There is that power, that moral restraint. My daddy had it. When I was a boy, if I were cutting up in church, my daddy didn't have to come get me. All he had to do was get my attention. And, and if he saw me and he, he moved his head like this until he caught my eye, and then he just looked. <laughs> didn't say a word. And with his eye, he shut my mouth and folded my hand and slid me back in the pew with a promise of things to come. <laughs> with his eyes. Now if a man can do that, what about Christ? Whose holiness and whose righteousness flashed through his eyes. Remember now, divinity mingled with humanity flashed through his eyes. If he had looked at that woman, he would have crushed her right down in the dirt. So he was a gentleman. He wouldn't even look. He looked at those who brought us in their self-righteousness. And the first thing he decided to do was get their attention. He said, all right, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. And while they were thinking that one over, he knelt down and with his eyes on them and looking at the ones he knew were guilty, he began to write that dirt on the ground. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what he wrote, but he wrote their sins. There were liars standing there going to stone somebody else. He wrote down there, liars. And, and, and these liars looked at it and looked at him, and they dropped their rocks, and they went walking off. And then he wrote down extortioners. I'm not in the community, some of you are doctors, but all you do is jerk and Bleed the widows dry. Take every dime you can while not curing anybody like a lot of them today. Extortioners. And they looked at it and, and dropped their rocks in one. And adulterers. And a whole lot of rocks fell. <laughs> he kept on writing. And he kept on writing until every one of those hypocrites had dropped his rocks and walked off. And finally, when they all were gone, and just Jesus and that sinner, he spoke to her. And he said, woman, now I know how that sounds to you. It sounds so impersonal. Woman, but you have to understand something about the Middle East. You see, when Jesus was on the cross, he looked down through spit and blood and sweat. And he saw something that wrenched his heart. His own mother had fainted and dropped down beneath the cross and profane Roman boots were stepping over his mother and Jesus looked out out into the periphery of the crowd for somebody to help him and he spotted John the beloved disciple and Jesus cried from the cross John come here and John walked over and Jesus said to John take care of my mother and then he looked down at his mother and he said woman behold I son he called his mother woman that's the way of the Middle East and when he talked to this harlot, he called her the same thing he called his mother. He said, woman, where are your accusers? And that woman heard a different tone now. She heard the voice of God. The voice of God is a voice of mercy and pity and compassion and pardon. And when she heard it, 
She found the courage for the first time to lift her head and look out through her reddened eyes. And when she looked around, she saw nothing but a pile of rocks and the rock of ages. And then she looked at Jesus and she said, no man, Lord. But you know, that was more of a question than a statement. In other words, Lord, I heard what you said, and I know why they left. They left because they were not worthy to spoon me. They were no better than I am, but you're worthy. You, Lord, are pure and holy. I recognize you. You're the Son of God. You've never sinned. You're the only one that's got a right to take these stones and kill me. Now, I deserve to die. No, man, Lord, are you going to do it? Will you stone me? And she's looking at him, pleading with her eyes. And Jesus, who keeps bad company, said, Neither do I condemn thee. Neither do I condemn thee. Now, I want you to notice, he didn't say, Neither do I condemn adultery. He does. And if you're fooling around, he condemns it. He didn't say, Neither do I condemn sin. He does. He said, I do not condemn thee. He speaks and his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing. We don't even have a record that she thanked him. But we know she was never the same again. She had heard the voice of God speaking pardon and peace. And his voice was like the ringing of the angelus at noonday. It was like the smell of a rose in a sick room. The voice of God was like the rainbow after a storm. She was never the same again. That woman was the last to leave the cross and the first to reach the empty tomb because Jesus keeps bad company. Went to a town and ran a meeting like this. Only it lasted a long time. There was a drunk, came every night, shake my hand. His name was Willie. And because he was small of stature, everybody called him Little Willie. And every night, stagger down the aisle and shake my hand. And every night I smelled it. Even if he didn't stagger, I smelled it. And finally we got down to decision time. And we told the people, it's time to make up your minds to do God's will. And to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my staff member came to me one day and said, Pastor, guess who wants to be baptized? I said, who? She said, Little Willie. I said, oh, I don't want to fool you. Little Willie's a drunkard. She said, but pastor, I've been talking to him, and he says he wants to be a Christian. I said, i got no confidence in drunks. Every night, he smells of liquor. And every night, he shakes my hand, and I smell it. And last night, I smelled it. I'm not interested. And that staff member pleaded with me. Finally, I said, all right, let's go see him. Got in my car and drove over to this house where Willie stayed. Went in and sat down and called for him. And this young man who had been drinking for so long and who looked like what he was came in and sat down in front of me. And I'm going to tell you all something. I tried to make Christianity so hard that he'd change his mind. I brought up all the rules and the regulations. And I went over them, you know, and every time I would explain it and read the Bible, I'd say to him, do you understand that? Yes, sir. You still want to be baptized? Yes, sir. Couldn't get rid of him. Finally, I got on liquor. I told him what the Bible says. I turned and read it like I'm going to read it to some of you before it's over. I read what the Bible said about it. And then after I read it, I said, now I want to make something very clear to you. We don't tolerate drunkards in our church. If I catch you drinking, I'm not going to throw you out immediately. I'm going to come and pray with you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to read the scriptures to you. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to give you a chance. But if you don't cease and desist, I'm putting you out. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. You still want to be baptized? Yes, sir. I actually left him a little disappointed. When we got ready to baptize, I'm standing waist deep in a baptismal pool. 125 souls walking in, surrendering to Christ. And after I was about half through, I looked up and here comes Willie. And I got so discouraged, I stopped the whole service and asked the church, pray for this young man. He's got a problem. Willie just smiled and I baptized him, went on out. And then I closed my meeting. But at my church, we were preaching Sunday night and Wednesday night and Friday night. And I know drunks and I know how they usually act. And I said, well, after a couple of weeks, he'll disappear. But he didn't. Kept coming. Every time I get up preaching, he's sitting right there in front of me. 
And I begin to say, when's he going to drop out? How much longer I got to look at it? And finally one night, I stood up to preach and I looked out and Willie had on a necktie. First time! The knot was way down here, but he had it on. <laughs> kept on coming. Listen to me. Kept on coming. After a while, that knot moved on up into place. That's what I like about the gospel. Gospel not only is straighten out your heart, it'll wash your face, it'll brush your teeth, it'll comb your hair, it'll clean your house. And then one Sabbath day, Willie walked into church, had on a suit, coat, and the pants matched. <laughs> had a man in my church who was manager of a television station, went over one Sunday to check with him about something. He said, Pastor, guess who's working for me? I said, who? He said, little Willie. I said, well. He said, he's upstairs. And I took off running. And I met little Willie in the hall, pushing a broom. And I stood there, and like a sinner, I confessed to Willie and told him everything I just told you. Ask him to forgive me. The two of us stood there with tears streaming down our face. Willie said, Pastor, I can't begin to tell you what the Lord has done for me. He said, this is the first job I've had in 20 years. He said, I'm going to buy me a car and bring my friends to church. That was in 1957. About a month ago, I was in that town again. They had called on me to preach. The church was packed, and the first associate pastor stood up and introduced me. Would you like to guess who the first assistant pastor is? Little Willie! Bless God! My Savior keeps bad company. That's why there's hope for you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you're doing, if you want to straighten up, there is power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Cut the lights off, please. Let's go to the screen and close this meeting. Here is the gospel. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should not perish but have everlasting life would you say amen? amen take one of those spots off please thank you so much i want you to see what i got on the board up here jesus was given to the human race he was given to sinners and he said i didn't come to save those who are already saved i came to seek and to save that which was lost those that are well need no physician. Some of these self-righteous hypocrites are walking around so holy, all they can do is criticize. They don't even see they need the Lord. But tonight, I need the Lord. How about you? And if you feel you need, doesn't matter what you've done, don't come telling me how bad you are. I know little Willie. Don't come telling me how bad you are. There's a prostitute I'm going to meet when I get to heaven. I want to shake a hand. I want to talk to that woman who was caught in adultery. She's going to be up there in the sweet fields of Eden where the tree of life is blooming. I, I want to meet her and I want to ask her what it was like when she heard Jesus say, neither do I condemn thee. Don't tell me how bad you are. My God keeps bad company. If you've got 10 gallons of sin, he's got 15 gallons of grace. Because the Bible says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Would you say amen? That's why he came down here. And he came all the way to the bottom in order to save from the bottom up. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, what a mighty God we have. What a mighty Savior we love. Your character flaws, your bad habits, your sins that bind you and make you hopeless. Tonight ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And there is a God in heaven whose greatest delight is cleaning up sinners. And the worse the sinner, the more the glory. Amen. I'm so glad for a Savior like that. I don't know what to do. Now, it's up to you. If you want it, you can have it. If you determine to walk in darkness and, and, and be stubborn and bullheaded, you can't be cleaned up. But if you're willing to walk in the light, 
and start right here. Don't try to start with the law. The law is for holy people. Start right here where unholy folks start, where Jesus keeps company with bad people. Start right there. Make a surrender. Ask him to be your savior. Confess your sins to him. Believe that he'll keep his word and take your sins away. Believe you become his child. Then ask him to walk with you. And if you stumble, ask him to forgive you and give you another chance and see your life develop into the life of a saint. That's the grace of God. And that's the glory of God. But you got to humble yourself. You got to do some praying. You got to get down with the Lord. Come off your high horse. Get your nose out of the air. Humble yourself. Stop looking at others and look at yourself. Bible says, let a man examine himself. Stop worrying about the preacher and the deacons and all those hypocrites you know in the church. Went to a place once and somebody came to me, oh, you know, always long face, never happy. Hypocrites are never happy. Always got a, a problem. Oh, Pastor, you know, I would do right, but all these folks in the church. I said, I want you to answer me a question. Why do you find hypocrites so attractive that that's all you look at? <laughs> there are some saints in the church, too. But above all, that's Jesus. Look at him. <laughs> when I was a child, I learned a nursery rhyme. It said, Pussycat, Pussycat, where have you been? Been up to London for to look at the queen. Pussycat, Pussycat, what did you there? I frightened a little mouse under the chair. You ever hear that? If you did, say yes. All right, now, I've been to London. My wife and I have been to London. We went into John Wesley's church, told you about it. We went to Buckingham Palace, saw the changing of the God. We went to the Tower of London. We went to the place where Sir Walter Raleigh was put to death. We saw all the crown jewels. There we saw Westminster Abbey. There are wonderful things to see in London. But what did the pussycat see? A little mouse under the chair. You know why? Because that's what pussycats look for. Now, if all you're looking for in the church is a hypocrite, I can tell you the devil's got some there for you to see. But I don't enjoy hypocrites that much. I like to see the saints. I like to hear a good sermon from a good preacher. Let's say amen. I, I like to read my Bible in church. I'm not spending my time looking at hypocrites. And above all, I'm looking for Jesus. What do you say out there? You got to come down off your high horse. All this old belly aching excuses about, well, there's so many bad people. Always have been. There was a Judas amongst the twelve. And not only him, there was a Peter who denied his Lord. And there were the sons of Boagines, the sons of thunder, who were ready to kill somebody just because they didn't show proper respect. There was a doubting Thomas. All of them were messed up until the Holy Ghost came on them. Don't you go throwing away people either. They tell me if you get to heaven, there are going to be three surprises. One, you're going to be surprised you were there. <laughs> Second, you're going to be surprised that there's some folks there that you gossiped about and thought never would make it. And thirdly, there are going to be some folks missing that were such good hypocrites, you thought surely they would be there. <laughs> Who told you to judge? Drugs. Liquor. All this mess has made slaves out of us. And, 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 and my white friends who are here tonight love me and I love them, but we black folks have been slaves. And if anybody ought to run from slavery, it ought to be us. And yet we just dive in. Every old new mess comes along. Here we go. Slaves! Well, I'm telling you tonight, there is a God in heaven that keeps company with slaves. He'll set you free if you want to be free. He'll extricate you from this whirlpool of death. He'll do you the way he did that woman caught in adultery. He'll say, I do not condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He'll give you a changed heart and you'll love him then. Now tonight, behold, I stand at the door and knock, he says. If any man open, I'll come into him and I'll sup with him and he with me. 
He died to work this out. He paid a heavy price. We are not redeemed with money, with silver and gold, but with the silver of his tears and the gold of his blood. Jesus paid with his life to save sinners. I don't want that sacrifice to be wasted on me. What about you? I want Jesus to be my Savior tonight. And I know from what I've just preached, there's hope for me. What about you? Time to go home, folks. But before you go, I'm going to ask you what I asked you last night. How many of you understand now that Christ is desperate to save you? Do you understand that if you do? Say amen. amen. Do you want to be saved? Say amen. amen. Are you willing to do whatever Christ asks in order to be saved? If you are, I want you to stand now and bow your heads and let us pray. And let us go home rejoicing that our God keeps bad company. Our God is a mighty Savior. Oh, blessed Lord, here we stand again. Look at us, Lord. Look at us. We are weak and sinful and we make mistakes. But we want to go to heaven. We don't have much to offer you tonight. Nothing in our hands we bring. Simply to the cross we cling. Could our zeal no respite know? Could our tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. So we come empty. And we stand naked. And we plead for only one thing. We have no rights. We plead for mercy tonight. The mercy that brings salvation. Save us, Lord, from sin and rebellion and disobedience, recalcitrance and stubbornness and pre-opinionated ideas. Save us from ourselves, O oh Lord. There is hope for you who are worried about your past. There is hope for you when habits bind you fast. There is hope in Christ, on Him your burdens cast. There is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you, though sin your conscience mars. There is hope for you, though you've drifted back so far. There is hope tonight, however bad you are, there is hope in Christ for you. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Peace in your hearts and peace in your homes. This is our prayer for you in Jesus' name. Tomorrow night we're going to have a cross up here. We're going to settle one more spiritual conundrum. We're going to nail some things to the cross. And that subject will be clear to you. Don't let rain or shine or any other creature keep you away. Oh, blessed Jesus, watch over us and bring us back tomorrow. We beg in your name. Amen. Let everybody say amen. amen. To the glory of God, say amen again. Tomorrow evening at 7.15, a physician will stand here and speak to you for about 10 minutes. God bless you, my dear friends. Please pray for me. I certainly am praying for you. Good night, everybody. As the lights come on, go home safely. God bless you. This copyrighted message was professionally recorded and distributed by American Cassette Ministries with the express permission of its speaker, Pastor C.D. Brooks. Duplication is thereby prohibited. American Cassette Ministries is the authorized source of Breath of Life and other C.D. Brooks messages. For information about other C.D. Brooks messages, as well as many other outstanding speakers, write today to American Cassette Ministries, P.O. Box 922, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 17108 the tape ministry helping prepare America to meet Jesus Christ.